Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental... It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on Something a farm... I can see turning out of that black hole to luminous disc. It strikes him head on. Lord, they're turning into flames. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey Mountain. Isn't there anyone on the air? Isn't there anyone? October 30th, 1938, a night that will forever live in infamy. Hot on the heels of World War II, the Great Depression, and the first attempts at space exploration, the stage was set for one of the most memorable broadcasts in the history of the world. It was the golden age of radio. Families were able to gather around and listen to anything from symphonies to war updates in real time, no matter where they lived. This is when Orson Welles, who was only 23 at that time, directed the radio drama that erased millions of Americans' trust and left them forever skeptical. Joe Saltzman, a decorated journalist, including four Emmys and two Edward R. Murrow Awards, produced an Entertainment Tonight special about the War of the Worlds. He explains why people at that time were prone to mistake the alien invasion as fact. The reason the War of the Worlds was such a fantastic uh, situation at the time in the 30s is that people were used to hearing incredible things out of their radio. Things that you wouldn't even think were real, but you heard them on the radio, so you believed it. Wells took advantage of this attitude by formatting the drama to sound like a breaking news story, cutting in and out of what sounded like the regularly scheduled program. The public's response was more than Wells could have ever imagined, as reports of widespread panic and chaos were the front page stories on newspapers all across the nation the next morning. But is there a chance that it didn't really live up to the hype? Joseph Campbell, author of Getting It Wrong, 10 of the greatest misreported stories in American journalism, argues that the newspaper's reports may not have been as factual as the public was led to believe. Read closely, those articles, those reports, were, were based on very scattered anecdotes that together did not represent nationwide panic. Most people recognized it for what it was, as I say, good radio entertainment on a Sunday night in a time slot that that program occupied and had occupied for many weeks. While the unreliable reports may have just been the result of a lack of information, Campbell also argues that the newspaper industry may have had ulterior motives. The newspapers were feeling the pressure, the competitive pressure that radio was applying. And so in some respects it was in newspapers' interests, perversely if you will, to condemn, to castigate, to assail radio for not being a grown-up medium. So what was the true extent of the panic that night? Studies since have estimated that of the 6 million listeners, about 1.2 million believe the broadcast. Whether that statistic is exactly accurate or not, the bottom line is that whether it was the radio broadcast that night or the newspaper's reports the next morning, the media had a big impact on the public. But does the media still hold the same cloud with today's society, and could a war of the world scare ever happen again? KWWL's news director, Dan Schillinger, thought that people may not be as naive as they used to be. People are not as trusting as they were back then. I, I think society has changed. People are much more cynical now. Uh, they don't just automatically believe everything they hear. While this may be true, it is just one man's opinion, and some of the facts in years past may beg the differ. In 1949, Riots broke out in Ecuador after a local radio station reenacted the Wells drama in Spanish, resulting in six deaths and the station being burned to the ground. In 2006, Belgium citizens were outraged when they found out that a news bulletin about the country being split in two was fake. After seeing these situations play out, it seems feasible that people may still believe whatever the media tells them. In order to put this to the test, a social experiment was conducted in which a breaking news story about rolling blackouts and riots sweeping the country interrupted a regular program in a hair salon in Janesville, Iowa. Like the War of the Worlds, this broadcast contained several facts that didn't add up, including the statement that all cities east of Denver had already lost power. Despite the flaws, there appeared to be very little skepticism expressed by the viewers. Oh my God! What the f what? Right. What? That's 
crazy. Despite the small sample size, there appeared to be overwhelming proof that a mock newscast could easily upset a high percentage of Americans. But in today's digital age, how long would that scare last? Would Facebook and Twitter lead to the panic spreading faster, or would it stop the false reports in their tracks? Reading about the story via newsfeed or tweet would essentially have the same secondhand effect as someone in those days retelling the story to others in person which Campbell explains is exactly what happened. Imagine a frightened person coming in and saying, the world's coming to an end. I just heard it over the radio. Run for your lives. You can imagine that people who heard this frightened news all of a sudden would have themselves have been upset, perhaps frightened, perhaps even a bit panicked. To see if people believe what they find on the Internet and if they'll believe it coming from a complete stranger, a second social experiment was performed in Venice, California. The same news story was shown to passers-by on a tablet. I don't have to hear no more. That's crazy. I do have a co I have a comment. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, my God. Why would people do that? Let's drive you home fast. But, I'll make sure my driver, when he picks us up, we get back to the hotel before dark. And nobody even knows, like, I didn't even know. I'm going to let my, my family know. Um, let my friends know and probably go home and check on my dogs. Yeah. Maybe do some shopping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For food. <laughs> All right. And things like that, but yeah. Again, despite the small sample size, there was little evidence disputing the fact that people believe what they see, no matter what news media it comes from. So if people still believe what they hear on the radio, see on the television, and read on the internet, what is to prevent a war of the world scenario from playing out today? Salzman points out that it might actually be the Internet, after all, that turns out to be America's saving grace. The wonderful thing about the Internet and social media is if anything goes on, immediately you get hundreds, thousands of comments saying, hey, this isn't true, or look at this site, or go to that site, or check this out, this isn't right, or look at this, this isn't, isn't true. So I think the Internet self-corrects very quickly. While it appears that people may still be vulnerable to deception, Today's society's need for instant gratification would likely prevent any panic from lasting more than 30 minutes. Schillinger also points out how the diversification of media gives Americans the option to do some cross-checking that wouldn't have been possible in the 1930s. You know, back in those days, there were a few national radio channels that people listened to, and uh, they didn't you weren't able to compare and contrast from one place to another like you can now. They'd start flipping around and say, well, nobody else is saying this, so I guess it can't be true. While it is difficult to answer the many questions that arise from the war of the world's broadcasts conclusively, one thing will always remain true. Even if the panic wasn't as big as the newspapers reported, that night will always live on in the lure of American radio as an example of the power of broadcast journalism.